Um, so that's, and it's, it kind of follows what you would expose the, um, kind of what you would expect in terms of if you've got, if you're making the enolate, the kinetic enolate, that we can easily justify both of them based on stability. The kinetic enolate is all sterics, and the thermodynamic enolate is um, uh, Zaitsev's role. More, more substituted alkene is more stable. So if we, if we keep that in mind, that I mean, and really the way to keep them, since you can justify both of them, the way I keep them straight is kinetic usually means the simpler and thermodynamic is the more stable. And so if we can try and keep that in the back of our mind when we're working on any of these options, um, that's gonna help us a lot. Um, the other, and the other thing that makes the thermodynamic product more stable, it's not just state sense rule, um, the other resonant structure of the enolate is a, no, sorry, I forget I said that because that was, that's counterintuitive. Never mind. I thought I had another way of comparing that, but that's backwards. That would mean it was a couple cat. Um, but yeah, Zate sets rule for thermodynamics, sterics for kinetics. And so the, the main thing that you look for as the is just the temperature. If you're at um, dry ice temperatures with LDA, you're going to make the kinetic product. And we can try and do this with irreversible um, reactions so that you don't, so that when it comes back up to room temperature, it doesn't switch to the thermodynamic product. Um, so you, you kind of have to do this whole thing at, um, at dry ice temperatures. Um, but once you do that, you get a product that's relatively stable and will stick around. If you do it at room temperature or um, then you get uh, the thermodynamic product. And the other one, let's see, to keep in mind, I think I saw this on your quiz again, which was going back a few, a few weeks now. Um, if you're at high temperatures, another slideshow. Yeah. At high temperatures, you get the um, you get the alkene. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so if we, just if we're keeping that in mind, um, the other the other thing to remember when we're making these enolates is that if you if you want it to be irreversible, you've got to use sodium hydride or the LDA, um, which is the lithium diisobutyl amine, IMI, because it's deprotonated. Um, if you are okay with it reacting with itself and having it be an equilibrium reaction, you can use sodium hydroxide or sodium ethoxide. It's less common though. I mean, these are a lot easier reagents to work with, but generally speaking, from a synthesis point of view, we don't want equilibrium reactions. Yeah. Um, so, but if it's the beta diketone, then it's acidic enough that we can just use those what we normally consider a strong base, but a regular strength base, not a super base. Um, and we went through these. Uh, I think those are all that. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and this, these were the quiz questions. Um, did you have? Um, did you have the only the only thing you missed? I think was the, the dehydration reaction. So if you're good with that, then I think we can keep going. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So aldol reactions are what you get. So the the aldol product. I don't know why they use al as the prefix because it's generally a ketone rather than an aldehyde. But the aldol product is when you've got that that class two carbonyl um, in the beta position to a 
to a um, hydroxide. So it's a, the product that you get before dehydration um, with these. And yeah, I don't think about this. You know, okay. <laughs> Seems like, yeah, this is like a. There's only two of us here. <laughs> and just, uh, it's too bad the way that, that COVID hit all of us was staggered. Um, no, we, right. we couldn't just miss like a week and a half at the same time. Right, it's like four weeks. Right. It's been a really long time since I've given an opium lecture. Because it has been. <laughs> um, so the aldol reactions, if it's the same molecule reacting with itself, it's considered a symmetric aldol reaction, even though you don't make a symmetric product. The two reactants are symmetric. If you want to make a asymmetric reaction, it's called a cross aldol. Um, and it's not all that useful synthetically unless we go about it really deliberately. Because if we just use sodium hydroxide and we get that, that equilibrium mixture of enolate reacting with another carbonyl, you wind up with, so you can wind up, so say we have um, ethanol and propanol. You get two cross products and then two right. symmetric products. So not all that helpful synthetically. Right, yeah, yeah. because at the very least, you're limiting yourself to assuming they all have the same probability about a 25% yield. So, if we want to control that, we just make sure it's not an equilibrium reaction. Um, one of the ways you can do that is to make sure that you only have one reactant that can act as, as a nucleophile, if you only have one that can make the enolate that has um, alpha protons, um, then you're only going to ever get one product. If you do wind up, is this cinnamaldehyde, I think, right? Yeah. Um, so this actually would be kind of a fun one. I don't know if we have any propanol. It's alpha methyl Alpha, yes, okay. Um, we have, we have ethanol. Maybe we might be able to do this one. Oh, yeah. yeah. I know where that is. Um, so I know we have benzaldehyde. We can make cinnamaldehyde out of that'd be kind of fun, even if the reaction itself is boring. Um, yeah, we'll, so we'll let's look at that after class. Um, so we have benzaldehyde because there's no alpha protons, we only can get one product. Um, and you basically you can't get just, you don't even really require that much heat in this case because you, you're never going to see that. Um, uh, aldol product, you're always going to get the dehydrated product because that gives you that resonance. Um, it's, it would just be, I mean, if they go to the point to say not isolated in this textbook, because when, when we've made a lot of stuff that's really unstable in this textbook, um, it means it's like direction. Really? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and especially considering we're adding heat, but we're going against entropy. So this is way downhill in, in enthalpy. So that that's helpful as we just realized that's a pretty easy reaction to do if you if you're trying to make a product from these two pieces. Um, but if you want to have total freedom, you have to get more creative, more, you have to get those super bases out um, and create a permanent enolate before adding your second carbonyl. So if you took acetone and you added LDA to make your, um, your enolate, and if we did try to isolate this, probably we would control this with stoic geometry. Um, just make sure you only add enough LDA so that the acetone is, is um, completely deprotonated but without a whole lot of excess on either direction. Hey, Miranda. Hey, guys. Welcome back. Oh, man. How are you guys doing? Better. We're better. Yeah. How about you? I'm better. Yeah, this weekend really was like the turning of the corner for me. Yeah. I was so sick. I'm only wearing a mask because I got like a giant cold sore because it totally obliterated my immune system. I also had that. Yeah, and it like 
wrapped around in my mouth for a cake or so. It was just like that sounds, sounds, awful. sounds yeah, it sounds awful. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we all made it through the other side. <laughs> yes, yeah. agreed. Agreed. Did, um, was Hannah spared? Did she get it? Or I haven't heard from her. She's. I ran into her uh, early, uh, last week. And she was like, "Yeah, I got sick for a couple of days." Uh, she doesn't think that it was COVID because it was so okay. mild, but I also don't think she tested. So. Yeah, could be. It's it's amazing. That my wife is still home with it right now because she, as soon as I tested positive, she took the kids and she went to stay at my parents' house. So because we. Had have a separate house not yeah. that far away um, and isolated for me for five days before she tested positive. I tested positive Saturday morning and yeah. she waited until Wednesday, so she's still home with it. Okay. Yeah, um, did did Grace get sick? Yeah, we also tried to isolate from each other as yeah. well. Did not work out. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, we were both exposed at the school like before either of us had any symptoms. And, yeah. yeah she, she actually had a, you know, she she had like one day where it was like she felt pretty bad, but like for the most part she had an easy time of it. That's good. Uh, yeah, we're both just still like hacking stuff. Yeah. I know. And I coughed for six. And yeah, like, <laughs> that tiredness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That brain fog. And I'm also occasionally hallucinating a little bit. But Ooh. not like bad, just like you know, clouds of color like when I'm driving with that. It's like, yeah. I, I haven't heard about that one. I, I, yeah, I, mean, I, stood I, up. I like to keep that one to myself. <laughs> so that's, that's for my, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that part close. I, um, when I, I, when I was in the thick of it, I was a couple times I stood up and got, like, you know, that, uh, those black and gray geometric visuals you get when you rub your eyes too much. Oh, yeah. I got yeah. that when I stood up too fast a few times and almost fell over. But, yeah. Uh, but it seems to have subsided. So, oh my god. Um. All right. Well, we're just looking at at these aldol reactions. Um. So continuing on the same reaction that was in the in the quiz from two weeks ago and in the homework. Um. And really, the the trick with these, the most universal way to do this is to make a, a permanent enolate by using one of those super strong bases like LDA, um, which if you then try to isolate it, you might be able to actually isolate it as lithium, as the lithium enolate, which I don't even know how you would name that, um, but you could probably get that to crystallize out. Um, it wouldn't have very long shelf life, but you could probably do something along those lines before adding your second aldehyde. Um, but basically, we just use we just use the the order and the sequence of the reactions to control what's the nuclear which alpha carbon is the nucleophile and which is the target. Um, so whichever one is exposed to the LDA picks up the negative charge, gets decarbonated at the alpha carbon, and then can attack the carbonyl carbon of the next um, of your aldehyde or your ketone. This is and this is really helpful too because if you just have a mixture of the aldehyde and the ketone to begin with, aldehydes in general are more reactive, and you get all sorts of other potential reactions that could happen. Um, so, in addition to only getting one addition product, which then you could apply heat to get that alpha beta unsaturated ketone if you want it, um, but it does give us a lot of control here. And the main Trick with these, this is actually a perfect reaction for color coding to keep track of what came from where. Um, and just and the that black bond that we form, our new bond, is always going to be between the alpha carbon from the first carbonyl and the carbonyl carbon of the second carbon. And we can make that logic work if we, if we went through and draw the mechanism, but if, if you're trying to not draw the mechanism for every single reaction, um, that's that's the key. It, this is one where, though, where while you're getting used to it, drawing an enolate first so you can visualize it as a nucleophile would be really helpful. 
Uh, and as noted, this is called directed alcohol addition, as opposed um, as opposed to a just a symmetric alcohol reaction. And then this is as we didn't officially define it. Um, that product there is the alcohol, is an alcohol. So again, I don't know why they used alb instead of heat, heat ketol. Probably because that was already used in biochemistry. So kind of ketol is a thing. Um, but either way, that's our, our product for these. And then once it dehydrates, we add heat. We would wind up with that product. And it's always it's easy. It's, it's not one where you get competing um, elimination products because it's always going to make the product where you've got that conjugation because conjugated the pi bonds are way more stable than having an SP3 carbon in between them. All right, so let's do this a little bit backward from normal. Let's work this backward to say what are the reactants and what would the reaction order have to be to get this product. Yeah, so find the alpha carbon from the carbonyl that's still there. And the carbon that now has the alcohol was the other carbonyl carbon. So I drew that line is where it would get broken apart. So it'd be three pentanone. Check down to gray. Right. So there's reactant one. That's the one we turn into the permanent enolate with LDA because then it's going to make this is our enolate. And then if we then expose it to butanol, so these four carbons and that OH was an, a carbonyl before. And so it's because it's on a primary carbon that that would make it the aldehyde. Here's the reaction steps there. Once you make that enolate, all you have to do is drop in the other, the other carbonyl. Um, there's no other reactant necessary to add in that case because you already made your nucleophile. Um, and then I think it follows up by adding water just a pro as a proton source so that you don't wind up having a negative charge on that on that oxygen. So we get this, and then as soon as you expose it to a proton source, we get the product we're looking for. So a little convoluted of a reaction just because we can make really complicated looking molecules from, from molecules that didn't start out that complicated. You know, we've known how to name pentanone for a long time. It's a very simple molecule, but we can make very complicated molecules. Um, from, from relatively simple ones this way. And the other thing to pay attention to is, is our rules for making our permanent enolates still apply. And when it comes to thermodynamic versus kinetic control, if it's an asymmetric zone. So if we had two pentanone and then we expose it to LDA, we have two choices for where, where that, that negative charge is going to be, where we're going to deprotonate 
out of those two alpha carbons. So you have to remember that sterics is favored by kinetics. And, um, and so you would you deprotonate the primary carbon if we did this at dry ice temps. We would get that in the late. But if we did, and I don't know why they usually use NaH at room temperature rather than the LBA. Um, maybe LBA is exothermic or something, so they don't they don't want to use that at room temperature. Um, but for whatever reason, if they're specifying at room temperature using either LBA or sodium hydride. You're going to get the thermodynamic enolate, which puts your negative charge on the more substituted. Right, so that is, we all of a sudden have a lot of different levers we can tweak to get different products in a very controlled way. Because if we change what order we do these, we, um, Mix these carbonyls. We can change what's the carb, what is the nucleophile, and what's the target. If we change the temperature when we make that enolate, we can change which of those alpha carbons gets deprotonated. So, you know, we have if you have a 50-50, you know, you have two options for each of those two cases. That gives us four different possible products we could make potentially um, just by varying temperature in order. Um, which is, is really nice that it's very predictable that way. Um, it's not like SN2 where it's a sliding spectrum. These are very binary decisions. You go first here or first there, um, as opposed to just, well, you're going to get a little bit of everything. All right. So it gets a little trickier to visualize them. When they've been dehydrated, so <coughs> excuse me. If you call it an alcohol condensation, then that means it's also gone through the dehydration reaction as well. And so, any any time you have that alpha beta unsaturated ketone or aldehyde. You can make that from an aldol condensation, but you've got to work backwards the extra step to figure out where your alpha carbons work. So try and work these backwards, turn it back into the aldol, and then you can break apart that molecule a little bit.
So I'm going to work through the first one. Give you all a shot at the others. So if you can start by undoing the dehydration, remember that the, the aldol products, <clears throat> before they go through the dehydration, you've got the, the OH is on a beta carbon relative to the carbonyl. And so that tells us that it has to be this carbon. And then if you can work your way back from that, like we did on the previous slide, okay, well, that alcohol carbon was the target for the nucleophile. So that's the bond that was formed. So that means that this was the alpha carbon that attacked. And the beta carbon was the other carbonyl. And as we've done in the past, it can be helpful to keep everything spatially in the same position when you're drawing these out so you don't lose a carbon. Sometimes that makes it look a little bit weird. I don't like the way that looks like the oxygen has three bonds. So I'm just going to draw the carbonyl oxygen. At a bad angle. So I arrived at that as well, and I was like, I don't know if this would work. I guess uh, it's symmetrical. So either one of the alpha carbons could be could be your target, yeah. Or can you could be the enolate? We would if we want it to be the primary carbon that's gonna be the nucleophile. We would need to do this under kinetic conditions. So we need to do this at dry ice temperatures to make sure we put the negative charge here instead of here. But if we put it at the other alpha carbon, I mean, we're not really going to get it. It's going to be too strained. Oh, oh uh, because I was of the other. Oh, sorry, over here. Yeah, so I meant on the on the secondary alpha. If we try to do it. Here, that's still a possibility if we did it at room temperature, but we wind up making a four sided ring. Which, and then if, when, if we tried to go through the elbow or the condensation part, it's going to wind up making um, a four sided cy a cyclobutene, which is going to be even more strain. So, this is one where, where we probably won't have competing reactions, even if we did do it at room temperature. Um, but to speed things, oddly enough, we might speed things up by doing it at dry ice temperatures because we're going to favor only making one of the enolates. We don't have a competing equilibrium happening, um, even if it would eventually all get us to the same point anyway. And then, yes, if we, if we turn this around and drew it in a more... <clears throat> Um, standard skeletal structure, we would get two, two, six heptadione. <clears throat> so I think we've gotten. <clears throat> ring formation and ring opening reactions will continue to be one of the trickiest things to visualize, but we have had some practice with that at this point. So, you know, same thing as usual, keep track of your carbons, make sure you didn't gain a, a carbon somehow or lose a carbon somehow. Um, and keep everything spatially in the same spot where you're sure what you have and before you redraw it. So for this second one, this one's, I don't think this one's symmetric. No, it is symmetric, it's still I think. So that's our alpha carbon, which means our OH is on the beta carbon. And 
exact bond that was brought down, <coughs> that was formed. And we wind up with Hexane dialdehyde. Dial. So, so far, two symmetric ones. So these ones, again, the order would not have mattered in either case. You just need to keep rotating alpha carbon, but all the alpha carbons in this case are symmetric or the same. So you get the same product either way, regardless of which one was the nucleophile. And if it's going to be a Um, if it's going to be a cross aldol reaction. So for all of these, you could just do this through the pi bonds, but that makes it a little bit harder to see what that carbonyl looks like unless you're very careful. I, I find it more helpful to draw the, the aldol and because then from there I can work backwards with both of the carbonyls a lot easier. So for C, we <clears throat> that's what our alpha would look like. And remember the bond is formed between the alpha and the beta carbons relative to the remaining carbonyl. So our molecules we started with would be benzaldehyde and acetone in this case. We would need specifically to deprotonate the acetone with, um, with LDA or sodium hydride on its own and then expose it to the benzaldehyde. And this is when <clears throat> you wouldn't actually, because there are no alpha carbons on the benzaldehyde, you could do this one also just sodium hydroxide um, and, and heat and let the um, reaction just go by equilibrium route. You don't need to do it in that directed ordered approach. A sequential approach because there is no competing alpha carbon. The only two alpha carbons that have protons are symmetric and they're both on the acetone. Hmm. So that would give us, I don't actually know, but cinnamaldehyde, but as a ketone with a methyl group on the ends. So Be like, uh, I was just trying to think if there's a common name for that, if that's a molecule that has synthetic value or it would probably smell like cinnamon, interestingly. I feel like we're, we're going to call it some kind of butene. Uh, but, yeah, butene, or phenyl, phenyl butenone. Number of systems. It's going to be like that. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, okay. Yeah, my kids can go fast right now, but I'll be trackers right outside the window. It's so cool. 
So this, I mean, my kids like just going to Taco Bell because the car wash is right next door. So uh, for, yeah. for, for years, that was a frame of restaurant just because you could sit in the booth and watch the cars come out of the car wash. Yeah. I can't imagine the traffic that goes. The lakes, they take care of like right behind where the lakeside was. So oh. there's all this like huge machinery and big holes in the ground. So they love that. We had spent like five minutes doing a slow crawl around the perimeter. <laughs> Let's see. That's crazy. I don't know if you guys have driven by it recently, but the speed that that thing took down was like, they did it in like three days of like, they completely leveled and then dug out. Yep. The I had to drive over there today. So, I, I, yeah, I so never drove over there. The main casino building is still standing, but like all of the hotel ones and the, the building next to it that they were using as a leasing office for those really expensive beach condos, those are all completely leveled and gone. So I don't know what they're planning on doing with like the main casino building because right now that is still. Well, you'd be the person to ask because you at least you, you think you would hear rumbling. Dude, cause... this project is so weird. I don't know what they're doing. I have no clue. So Bart Barton bought it. If, um, so yeah, and because there's the urgent care over there, so it makes sense that they would add some more facilities on yeah. the Nevada side, maybe for people with insurance issues. It doesn't it's cost so it. vague with like what is going on in there, and huh. what they're doing, and when it's going to happen. It's just all been like a big cloud of mystery. So I would love for the building on there, but we'll see. <laughs> I, I wish that was the easiest top ten this weekend to all of my towels came from there. Well, this was, we used to do that in San Diego when I was in college all the time because all the pools were outside and it was really easy to you know, yeah. you just go over to Harbor Island and uh, um, by the airport and, and hang out with a nice Marriott. Yeah. Hot dogs. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, they keep a closer lid on things around here, so. They do. Yeah, people don't go up to a lot of hot tub, like, all right, I can sit for the hotel keys. Like, oh, I got kicked out a lot, but they would come by if we were making too much noise. Like, yeah. um, and it was late at night, especially. So. Yeah, like I said, they were just cool. They didn't yeah. There was, always, there was always the same guy. He'd come out at like 9.50, like, all right, 10 minutes, like, And it's like, I know this guy. He definitely recognizes us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I live here at the hotel. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. You're not bothering guests. Yeah. You know, it's just a usually we're hanging out with kids. Yeah. It'd yeah. yeah. be like the concierge. They should put you on the payroll. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You're given suggestions, maybe like. <laughs> this is interesting. So it does show up as a. Flavoring ingredient food and perfumes, but it doesn't say what it's <laughs> flavor or yeah. odor is like. I would assume it's cinnamon ish, just because of the same shape as we were talking about this earlier, Miranda. If you, if you don't have that glass carbon here, you get cinnamaldehyde, which is like the flavor of cinnamon. Um, that was cinnamon flavoring that you see in like red hots and stuff like that. It's just a pure cinnamaldehyde. Um, so with that extra carbon on there, and the fact that they use it as a flavoring agent, I would wager it's cinnamon-ish. But then again, the difference between vanilla and almond is only one carbon or one methoxy group. Yeah. Um, yeah, so group. Yeah. this two substitutions. Oh, is it? But, but they're you know they're not that. Um, it doesn't like I would never guess. Without like experience with those compounds, that they would be all as different from each other as they are. Yeah, so a lot of times you can because it's because literally sense and taste is is your is your body trying to assign a molecular structure qualitatively. Like, oh, these things taste similar, they probably have similar molecular structures because it's fitting into receptor sites, right? So a lot of times you can just, and this is one of the, the uh, lectures that I had to cut because of, of COVID, um, was drug discovery, where they basically say, here's a drug that does something we like and other things we don't. Let's chop it up into pieces and see which parts cause this, the reaction we like, and which parts cause the reaction we don't. 
which is why you have all of the topical anesthetics all have pain at the end of the names because they're all cocaine derivatives. Um, take cocaine and you chop off certain parts of it and you get benzocaine and propane, etc. Um, because they act, they fit into some active sites then, but they don't fit into the ones that cause high in addiction. Um, so you see a lot of that in, in drug discovery as well, but also in flavor chemistry where they, well, what, what does this do? Um, it's pretty cool. I saw this, uh, that reminds me, there's uh, this uh, amateur chemist who did, uh, made it, did all these experiments for like two years and then made a table of the results. And it was the, it was making all the esters starting from like methyl formate going up all the way to like oil mermaid or decalette or something. So, and then he's like across, you know, it's like one axis of the table is the acid and then the other axis is the alcohol. And then where they meet is the ester. And then at that point, it's like this ester this boiling point smells like this. And it was like really cool. It's just like some of the stuff smells like, uh, you know, like aged cheese or like this smells like a disgusting, like skunk smell. And it's so weird that like these like little changes are like, always like a lot of changes. But a lot of them smell like hair. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually how you get um, beers, especially Belgians or sour beers that have like weird fruity notes to them. Um, it's because the yeast, different strains of yeast, when you put them under certain stress conditions, will make esters as a byproduct when they're trying to continue on the fermentation process. Um, they wind up making these ester byproducts. Um, and so you can actually, the one that, that I know well is, is Bavarian style wheat beers use a certain strain of yeast and ferment at very specific temperatures. If you ferment it at 68 Fahrenheit, you get notes of banana because it makes that isoamyl propanoid, I think it is. Um, and but if you go four Fahrenheit higher, it ferments at 72 Fahrenheit, you get notes of cloves. Um, and but that's all because of the way you're it's it's doing the same thing but allowing the yeast to control it. Now we can't prevent the yeast from doing that anyway, other than fermenting at different temperatures, but it's basically making these esters in a very controlled way. And making things that don't, you know, they don't add banana to these beers, but they sure smell like it sometimes. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, the flavoring compounds are really, really fascinating. And it's the, the organic chemistry is actually fairly simple, um, relatively speaking. Is that like, so one of my friends that I, uh, from college ended up doing like a master's program in food science. Mm -hmm. When they do that kind of thing, where they like look at the structures and flavors and sometimes it depends on which way you go with it. You yeah. can go food science where you're doing things like like increasing shelf life on foods and so working for NASA to make freeze dried foods for astronauts to have certain properties like they need to be really light, they need to have really long shelf life, they need to not form crumbs when you eat them, yeah. um, which. Interestingly enough, they use tortillas instead of bread on uh, the International Space Station because tortillas don't make crumbs when you eat them the same way that that white bread does. Um, so all of their sandwiches are in tortillas. Um, but then the other route that you can go is more of like an engineering route, like, okay, how do we take this recipe and scale it up for General Mills to make something that can that can be shipped out and be really consistent across the entire and that's a there's a huge field there I actually applied for a few jobs because that's actually a really big field in in uh, Minnesota. I don't know why, but Minnesota wound, wound up having a lot of corporations have their headquarters there, including General Mills and several other is big it basically foods. Procter & Gamble somewhere in the Midwest? Or Target or is. Not? Procter & Gamble started on the back east, but it wouldn't surprise me if they moved to the Midwest. There's, there's geographic advantages to being in the middle of the country, and there's also tax advantages. Um, even though Minnesota is a fairly blue state, um, it kind of hits that sweet spot for corporations where it's a, a blue state so they can attract good workers that want to live there um, and have decent quality of life but and good research as a result. 
but it's also not as blue as say New York or San Francisco, where you know where you've got lots and lots of tax restrictions. Um, so they tend to form in really high research areas on the coast and then move to places like Minnesota once they're a giant multinational corporation. It's the economics of, um, of chemical companies and, and General Mills kind of fits in that category, oddly enough, is uh, our, our fascinating to look up, DuPont, Dow, 3M. 3M is based in Minnesota, that's the other big one. Um, Best Buy was, they know the business, are they still Best Buys? They're still, yeah, the one in person's still open. I think they, they cut a lot of their stores, but there are still some. Circuit City used to have a bunch of Circuit Cities and they all just appear. <laughs> like, right. Yeah, I yeah. think it's still Circuit Cities are gone. Best Buy, I think, is still. We had a Radio Shack up here for a long time, even after Radio Shack nationally went out of business. It was like Kmart. There's like two of them left in the country and one was in South Lake Tahoe. Yeah, yeah, they actually had useful, they still had like Radio Shack, like circuitry. Yeah. It wasn't just like a cell phone store. Um, like it, like most of them ended up. All right, back to. <laughs> so uh, Well, I don't mind this because I'm still having a hard time. I was going to say we all have our so, COVID brain. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm I'm okay with the, the pace we're going right now because all of these things are close enough to each other that we can um, jump back in there without too much trouble. And esters are relevant because if it's not an alcohol condensation, the esters will go through the same thing, um, except they don't go through that dehydration reaction because, it will, because you have a good leaving group on attached to your carbonyl, you don't make the alcohol, you just kick off that ethoxy group. So it'll do the same thing where you start by making by deprotonating the alpha carbon, maybe. Um, I think it's still considered an enolate, um, even though it's an ester enolate. Um, which then, so, if we have that attack our other molecule, It'll temporarily make a weird, weird looking tetrahedral intermediate where you have a deprotonated oxygen and an epoxy group and the new bond we just made. But then, just like when we were making our, our different acid derivatives, when you have a good leaving group, it's more advantageous to just take off that leaving group and reform the carbonyl. So, our intermediate would look. Something like this. So it looks a lot like an aldol, but because it's an ethoxy group and not just an ethyl group, we kick off the ethoxy. And form this this product, where we've got a beta keto ester. Um, and so that's called a clason condensation. The same clason that has uh, clason clason tubes, right? Clason condense. No, what's it? No. Adapter, sorry, plays an adapter. Yeah. Um, so same, same chemist. In this case, it's not like Hoffman, where there's 17 different Hoffmans. Um, 
And so here's the, the more neatly drawn mechanism for it. You deprotonate your alpha carbon. So I guess they call, they just call them ester enolates, um, which then attacks and make you pet that weird tetrahedral intermediate. Take off the leaving group. And now you have a, a doubly stabilized alpha carbon. You've got something that's an alpha carbon to both um, carbonyls, which means it's even easier to deprotonate. <coughs> so we do wind up with that. We need to be careful if we want this to not continue on reacting. We have to watch our stoichiometry and then make sure we give it a proton source at the ends to protonate that, um, unless we want it to continue reacting. All right, so let's take our break. Come back at five after, we'll work on these two practice problems. Um, and talk about what, what these reactions look like. Get no, yeah. we're still testing them every morning. Yeah. Um, right now, but and my my son's teacher is out with COVID for the rest of the year. They finish next Wednesday. Oh no. I know. So that's sad. I know. Um, but no, I think they got they got their vaccine at a very different time than we did. Yeah. Because we got ours as soon as we could and then got boosted. Yeah. But then they got theirs, you know, six to eight months later. Yeah. For both of those things. And so I think maybe just the timing with that and the fact that it was the Moderna versus Pfizer or something like that. Um, or we just got lucky that whatever whatever variant we wound up with is not one that that they are as susceptible to. Yeah. We're still well, doing, you know, my wife's still wearing a mask in the in the house with them. When they're when they're around, just for the sake of yeah, just, just in case. case. But yeah, luckily, luckily enough, we're okay so far. Yeah, Cole tested positive, but he just had like a low grade fever, and they both I mean they're toddlers, so they both have runny noses and coughs all the time. Right. So it's like hard to tell. <coughs> but Drew, Drew never tested positive, but I also could not get a good sample on him because he was just flailing. Yeah. But Paul let me do it. He was awesome. You know what really helped? Because because the dash my oldest, mm -hmm. you know, at at six was full on struggling when this first started happening. We had to get tested. We yeah. Needed that nose swab. Yeah. Um, and holding a, a six year old is hard. Yeah. It. So, but what eventually started working was um, we uh, let them do it themselves. Oh, nice. Teach them how to swab their nose because then they're in control of it and it becomes more of an activity oh, rather than a really good idea. So, and yeah, we wasted some tests while they figured out how to do it that didn't, you know, they didn't get deep enough and stuff like yeah. that. But they, and now, now it's really helpful because we set stuff up in the mornings and like I can hop in the shower, they do their own tests and add the drops and everything. And yeah. then I get out of the shower and it's all done. That's awesome. Um, so, but yeah, they're still okay at this point. That's good. That's good. Yeah. We're really hoping that it's not just a so we my uh, my side of the family does uh try we try to do a family vacation that's sort of a you know my parents paying to get just so they can get me and my brother and our families all in the same place. Yeah. So we're supposed to go to Hawaii the week after the fourth of July. Oh, so I'm really yes. help, hoping the kids don't have it show up like in I, July, I but in two weeks. Is Hawaii still requiring tests for entry? I actually haven't looked into that. I don't. I know at like the height of the pandemic, like Hawaii was the strictest place. Like I think they required a test for entry, and then you needed one for exit. But I don't. I know that they got rid of the. Uh, like the testing required for flights now. 
So maybe to get it flying to they got rid of it. Not that you want to take your kids on an airplane if they're busted, but right. And no, that's, that's a good thing to know. Um, so I should look into that. Yeah. I know I have a friend who lives in Hawaii, and he said that I I talked to him um, in the, the depths of, of late in like December 2020, and he said Hawaii never shut down. Yeah, they were still allowing tourists the entire time. Yeah, but were. so that must have been how how they were getting around that. They were yeah, they were a lot of testing for everything. Uh, but yeah. My fish is probably get in touch with him in a while. He has one of those cool jobs you never really hear about. Um, he's, he wound up, he had a degree in agricultural engineering from Cal Poly, um, which is like a combination of, like, there's a lot of chemical engineering components to agricultural engineering because it's all about maximizing yield and processing products and, and designing equipment. So it's like mechanical engineering and farming and chemical engineering all sort of fused. Um, but so he got into, actually for a long time, he was doing like technical sales to Guam. He would wake up, um, like there are times are even different from Hawaii, but he would like just be on the phone with people from Guam selling them like tractors and stuff like that. Oh my God. Um, and like chemical reactors for, um, for, I don't know exactly what, what industries they have on Guam even. Um, but then we got into uh, processing turmeric. Huh. Um, so basically, like because turmeric grows like a weed in Hawaii, and then it was, and then it was like the latest. I was going to say trend, now right? it's like so trendy. Turmeric oil and turmeric supplements, and he's like, yeah. well, we have this stuff that's growing like a weed anyway. Let's just do basically just play around with different extraction methods to try and extract turmeric oil and, and process it. And then sell it to these supplement companies. That's um, cool. Yeah, it's 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 one of those like I never would have thought. But it's basically doing what the cannabis industry did in California, but for turmeric. Like it's like in his garage, um, mixing stuff together and like walking through how to purify some things. What does it grow like that on every island, or is he on a specific island in Hawaii? So I'm the island that has a med school because it's right I think that's Hawaii. off a lot of, I Yeah, think. I think so too. Huh. What island are you guys going to? We're going to the big island. I love the big island. I've never been. I've um, never been to Maui. It's awesome. Be, it's really like, I mean, it's so different depending where you are. And the, they have like a, the snorkeling is really cool. And like kids can do it too. Uh, like Captain Cook's Cove or something, I think it's called. We're, up on, we're on the west yeah, the it's on side. the, it's on the west side, the cool. area. I know, I talked to Bruce about it because, again, in the depths of the pandemic, I was like, I think like January and February 2021, Bruce lived in Hawaii for two months by himself. Yeah. I was in his class. Yeah. I was pissed. <laughs> oh, it's, um, there was, there's a like, man, you can tour like the coffee um, bars in Kona, which I definitely recommend. And even for the kids, it's just like really cool to see if you get to sample all the beans. And there's a place called Big Island Bees. Okay. And they it's like a honey farm and bee oh, farm, cool. which is they they make like delicious honey, all sorts of flavors, and you get to see like where the bees live. So it's cool for kids too. But I think that's all on the west side. I think because oh, the big yeah. island bees is like close to well, I know, I know we're going to definitely go see the volcano because yeah. seeing actual lava has been on my bucket list since I was like five. Uh, yeah, right. so cool. <laughs> and, yeah. And my kids are getting into the already. So I'll let you. And I'm going to get I'm going to get breakfast. Like, oh, okay. I'm so excited to see that. Yeah. The seeing lava? No, I mean, oh. I, I personally, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like. Uh, on the one hand, I'm like, know that the like, colonization of the island is not good. Like, people are still are happy about the situation. Yeah. They want to obtain independence from the United States. Oh, I didn't know that there was that independence movement. That doesn't make sense. There is. And, and that makes me feel like, like I, I don't feel like I'm welcome to, to go there as like a you know, tourist. 
even though it's technically the same country that I live in. When you need passports, it's like I also feel kind of kind of wrong about that. But on the other hand, I'm also at a place now where uh, the conquest of this place was not cool, uh, and that the people would like to uh, have independence from you know the state as well. And in some cases, very small, isolated places, they, they do just not feel right fake independence where they don't get like rights you know like they don't get actual like uh autonomy uh, from the united states yeah yeah and, and i think i think we have sort of a unique perspective on it as we're living in a tourist destination here ourselves right because we have that we understand that that love hate relationship with the tourists. We love the fact that the tourists allow us to have enough money in our community that we get to live here on a sustainable, a sustainable wage. But on the other hand, it's a real pain in the ass, and, and the tourists are not super fun. And I can only imagine being being indigenous to an island chain and having that aspect of it would only make that more of a a mixed feeling regarding that. Like, you know, we're happy to take your money, but you know, give us your money and leave. Yeah, and um, also, yeah, I'm really not trying to be a buzzkill. I'm <laughs> just uh, <laughs> explaining my rationale for not having already been on that. I would love to go. I think it'd be really cool. And maybe someday I'll, I'll like, uh, I think, like, for me personally, I'd have to, like, volunteer for a like, humanitarian effort in order to feel like I'm okay. Just within myself. Yeah. Um, that was actually recommended to me. But I was talking about like, yeah, I guess I'm never going to go to Hawaii and like, feel like an asshole for going there. But then it was like, well, you could go there and like, on, you know, intending to help people, you know, to get into like a bit of volunteer organization. Well, and, the, the, and there's also there's plenty of countries that that Americans as a whole go to bring their tourism dollars to like tourism is an industry independent of the horrors of colonization. Right. Um, and I feel like that's, you know, as long as you're respectful of it and uh, aware of these issues and that the history, you know, there's, are you going to deny them? Both, you know, yourself the chance to go there, but also like, you know, yes, it's pandering to some extent, but at the same time, you are also bringing money to their economy by going. Um, you know, politically, would you vote for Hawaiian independence? That that would probably be like a, you know, if you can say yes to that and you can also go and bring money to their economy, you're kind of supporting both sides, that I would say. But it is a like I I don't know that I'd want to go visit the plantation necessarily the plantations are cool and everything but there is that element of, of forced labor of the indigenous people um a long time ago there's that that would have to be handled very carefully um and respectfully but at the same time like farms are cool coffee beer i want to see how coffee beans are grown it's you know? really uh i forget the name of the one you went to but it was like seriously the best coffee yeah, which as as a not just a coffee addict, but also a culinary fan. Yeah. 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 The Kona, it's like so smooth. I don't I, well there's there's a huge element of freshness to some extent. Like yeah, it's roasted and it's pretty well preserved. And if you leave it whole bean before you grind it, that keeps it pretty well preserved. But there's also nothing like freshly roasted from the bean from the vine to the roasting oven to the cup, you know, that's, cause we did the same thing in Costa Rica where we got coffee that was like directly from somebody's backyard essentially. Um, and that was, it does taste different. It does. And they have this, it's like the pea berry of the Kona coffee plant. The, the pea berry is like the best part of it, which I've never even heard of, but it's like even a step above the Kona coffee with just like smoothness and flavor and oh my god it was ridiculous <laughs> it was so good yeah i did run into some people that uh really kind of worked who were doing uh coffee roast for the they had like like uh 
like still still wet days. And they it's like they roasted it in like multiple stages. Or one of them was like a dehydration stage, and then the next one was like the actual roasting. And they had this like uh, like it looked like a cast iron frying pan that has like a spinning mechanism so you can agitate things like roasting over like a fire. And yeah, it's like, almost like a it's like like a crank, right? Yeah, yeah, I've seen those before. And, and, like, just, and then we would like kind of like pulverize them in a mortar pestle because you know there's no electricity on the woods. And uh, it's probably the best coffee I've ever had. It's just <laughs> It's always fun when you find something like that that's not just marketing because usually it's like, oh no, there's this better type of coffee than the normal type of coffee, and let me charge you double for it. Um, that's yeah. just people being like, yeah, come roast some beans with us. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. All right. You might have talked to me a bit. I think, I think that I think that, that was like maybe the, the crucial hang up uh, overcoming moment. Cool. I, I I struggle with stuff like that too. So it's like, how do you support social justice and acknowledge historical wrongdoings in today's world? Right. It's not like we can un by not going, we can undo what was happening, what happened in the past. And we definitely always go to anytime we go anywhere, we try to avoid you know chains or anything that's bringing money from outside. Where the where it's not going to money's not going to stay money's in the community. Right, so you know, small restaurants, locally owned stuff, even around here, right? I want to go, you know, to, to Heavenly Village. To That's spend what money. I like about the Big Island is it's still so there's really not as many chains as there are, like in Honolulu or the yeah. Maui or Oahu. There's just it, it is a lot more like small family owned stuff. They still have like the Walmart and Costco, but I like if you leave the area around the airport, it's it's all like local. Yeah, it's cool. Business and stuff. Being considerate and uh, attentive and not obnoxious goes a long way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think like living here has taught me a lot about that. I had no idea the impact of tourism until we lived here and like started raising our family here. Oh my god, <laughs> like, we need to be a lot more conscious when we travel and where we're going and what we're doing to the communities. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And anyway, that's uh absolutely absolutely a point. <laughs> All right, let's do some more chemistry. We've got a few more minutes of chemistry in us today. At least I think so. <laughs> I've already learned this stuff before, so if you hit a wall, just let me know. Um, as far as these place and condensation goes, is there really, there's not really a whole lot that's tricky about the bases that we use to make the enolates. If we're gonna make a symmetric place and product, if, we're, if we want the molecule that we start with to react with itself, <clears throat> and then we just need something that's a, a strong enough base that it can deprotonate that alpha carbon. But the problem is we don't want to use a base that's going to cause competing reactions, like a conversion of one ester to the carboxylic acid. If we just took this ester and we exposed it to sodium hydroxide as a base, yeah, we deprotonate that alpha carbon a little bit, but you're also going to wind up with your hydroxide attacking that um, carbonyl carbon and converting it from the ester to the carboxylic acid form. So when we do these plates and condensation, we have to pick our base carefully so that it matches what we already have as our ester. Basically, you just whatever the leaving group is on your ester, that's what you have to use as your base. So we would have to use um, ethoxide as our base in this case, because then if it does attack that carbonyl carbon and you wind up with, with it going through, if it goes through substitution, you actually get the same product out that you started with. 
because like, even if you took this and and had some um, side reaction that looked like ethoxide attacking the carbon yield carbon, because we've seen that, right? Is how that's our mechanism for converting between the different acid derivatives. Our intermediate <coughs> then looks like looks like this. I should have color coded them. But then, so then, if if you wind up with your with a leaving group leaving and reforming the carbonyl, we just remade the same molecule we started with. Even if we swapped ethoxy groups, they're still both ethoxy groups. So chemically, it's the same molecule. Um, and you know, you can do studies where if you start with with this um, reactant, and then you use sodium ethoxide that is um, has carbon thirteen substituted. So you do an isotopic labeling experiment, is what they call that. You wind up making product that's like fifty fifty. Um, Carbon 13 ethoxies and carbon 12 ethoxies. So it just shows you that you have this other reaction happening, but as long as you're making the same product that you start with, it doesn't matter. So that's always what you want to use as your base in this case, or it has to be something that's very sterically hindered. Like LDA could work, but it's probably overkill in this case. Um, so we would just use sodium ethoxide here. And if it's a T-butoxy group, we use T-butoxide as our, as our base as well, um, which in the specifics of that don't matter if you put sodium T-butoxide, um, that we find I think it usually is found as potassium, terpetyl ter potassium or turkey toxic potassium is what they call it, I think. Just because the size of the ion, the potassium ion is bigger than the sodium ion, so it'll form a more stable molecule. And you can write it like that. It's not technically. That's like a, our standard stereotype interface. It's our standard. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Um, TBOK, right? Turkey potassium. You only yeah. wrote it that way. I'm trying to remember what we called it out loud. I think you were calling it T-Bock. T-Bock, that's right. Um, so we just put the T, the t butyl part in front so it doesn't look as weird as putting the potassium first. It goes against our instincts from Gen Chem when it comes to putting positive charge in front of an ionic compound, but it, it works in this case for what we're trying to convey. All right, let's try drawing some of these products. We go through plays in condensation. I'm going to step out and grab some water. Well, we all work on that.
Okay, so for a big molecule like A, if there are kind of big molecules, again, color coding can be helpful to keep track of what's going on. The net result of these is we're going to lose the leaving group and you're going to attach the carbonyl carbon to the alpha carbon. All right, so uh, I'm going to go through and draw this. So we do get another carbonyl, and then the rest of the molecule stays the same. So everything that's drawn in red to the left of the carbonyl is still there. So it goes one carbon, and then to a benzene ring. And like that is fine. If you wanted to try and clean that up, it's, this is not a, a structure that's going to look clean no matter what we do because it's just big and, and with all those ring structures, it's not going to look nice and linear no matter what we do. Um, so the main thing is just make sure you keep track of all your carbons and just remember that we're replace the leaving group with a bond to the alpha carbon of the other molecule. So if we do that for B, one, two, three, four. This part's not going to change. It's adding a new bond to a carbonyl carbon. Not the color I thought I was grabbing, but it work. And then so we have whatever is attached to the carbonyl is still there. So three carbons, one, two, three. On the second carbon, the dimethyl. Oh, and I left off those over here. And so as much as I give organic chemists a hard time for not balancing reactions, this is where they balance the reactions is making sure that all the carbons on your molecule show up and that you didn't lose anything along the way. We just ignore all the other leaving groups that are now not part of this molecule because we're so busy balancing this molecule with itself. Yeah. There's our alpha carbon, there's my new bond, and it is going to a carbonyl carbon. Which then has one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and an ethyl on carbon two. And so it's still a total of seven carbons. On this whole thing, the only thing we chopped off was the leading group.
So a lot of these, these reactions, as far as what you would actually take away from this class and moving forward into other classes and other fields, um, like it doesn't matter specifically that you can that you can write out the product of the Claisen condensation off the top of your head. It's more like learning that there are certain tools that exist for very specific purposes. If you go into organic synthesis, you still might never even use a Claisen condensation if you specialize in, you know, fluorinated compounds, say. If you specialize in areas that don't have carbonyls, you might never see this. Then again, if you specialize in carbonyls, this might be your workhorse reaction that you use every day or that, you know, every third reaction that you design has a place of condensation in it on the way somewhere else. So it's really like, you know, we want to be aware that these alpha carbon reactions exist and that there are these very specialized tools for very specific purposes, but it's, you know, it's a, like I said, it's a very specialized tool to put it in, in construction terms. It's like having a table router when you're a general contractor. Is that really helpful for some specific parts of the house? Yeah, very helpful. Is it as important as a hammer and nails? Absolutely not. Like the hammer and nails are all basic reactions or substitute. Those are our steps are in a mechanism that we've been using this whole time. This is just a very, very specific application of those. Um, if we want to do a cross Claisen condensation, same issues as with cross alcohol condensation. We either have to use an ester that doesn't have any alpha carbons, or we have to use LDA as our base. And luckily, LDA is sterically hindered, so you don't wind up with um, that substitution reaction happening too much. You still are going to have some of that. Um, where you wind up making an amide as a product, um, as a side reaction. But because LDA is hysterically hindered, it's, it's a much better base than a nucleophile. So you don't wind up with too much of the amide product. And again, it's just all about the order. The nice thing about esters is there's, there's only ever one alpha carbon, right? Because one side of the, of the carbonyl has your leaving group on it. So that's not an alpha carbon. So we don't need to worry about the kinetic versus the thermodynamic side. All right, last concept for today. And again, this is just a specific, a very specific, even more specific application of a Claisen condensation is you can have what's called a Dieckmann cyclization, which is just a Claisen condensation within the same molecule. <coughs> so just like earlier, we were talking about breaking apart um, the uh, aldol condensation products to make um, to make uh, straight chain molecules. You have the same thing happening here. It's just a matter of keeping it balanced. Don't lose any carbons. And remember that it's the alpha carbon from one ester that's attacking the carbonyl carbon of the other ester. And as we start getting to these more complicated molecules, you start seeing them, um, names that are, you might actually see them in like nutrition journal articles and stuff like that. Sometimes some of these, these uh, prefixes and stuff get co-opted by marketing teams and you know, dietary fats. Um, they, they have very specific mean, names in organic chemistry, which are not the same as their very specific names in nutrition, which is not the same as what they're peddling to you. Um, as a supplement or diet, um, necessarily. 
um, they tend to be related, but not necessarily mean the same thing. So ketosis is related to the fact to the prefix ketone, but it's not. And it's that one is a bad example because that is actually ketones being produced um, in the body. But it's like people probably like going on a keto diet and stuff like that. They're not eating ketones. They're just eating in such a way to purposely put their body into ketosis so they're producing ketones. And once you know all these prefixes anyway, and what the roots are, cyclic beta keto ester, you got, if we didn't have this figure here, you could figure out what that meant. Um, at least more or less what was what they're trying to convey, right? So it's definitely a case where etymology and understanding where the words come from is helpful in going back and forth between fields. All right. Here's some practice problems. Um, for these plays and condensations. So this is again, uh, was this was this in the homework problems? Did I put plays and condensations of the last few problems on there? I seem to remember, I didn't think I did because they weren't in the last set of slides, but I may have thrown in some problems on that assignment. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, um, what we'll do, that's a good place to stop anyway. Brandon, did you have any, um, were you able to work through any of those problems? Yeah. I, I just used the textbook. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what I was hoping everybody would do since I wasn't able to go through the slides with you. Um, but I think I'm at that point where if I keep talking very much longer, I'm going to start coughing uncontrollably. Um, so I think we'll, we'll call a lecture for now and uh, we use the time to catch up on, on this assignment or anything else that you've got outstanding in this class. Um, and then we'll do some sort of lab. Um, I'll see. I'll see about that benzaldehyde and ethanol reaction. See if I can find a procedure for that to make to synthesize cinnamaldehyde. That'd be kind of fun. That would be fun. Um, so we'll do that for lab. Oh, yeah, that'll that'll be our last lab. <laughs> <laughs> I know that one. Does. And Sean, uh, I for taking the final. Is it easier for you if 